This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is where we discuss war fighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large-scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman, the Command of Operations Group here at the Joint Readiness Training Center. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Crucible, the JRTC Experience. And today, I'm cornered and outnumbered by three of the best majors in operations group. I'd ask you to introduce yourself to the audience, please. Yes, sir. I'm Major Drew Zabriskie. I'm originally from Massachusetts. I commissioned through ROTC at it's, the... You're from Massachusetts. I am, sir. You're such a nice guy. <laughs> I know, sir. <laughs> it's a role, sir. <laughs> uh, let's see, sir. Commissioned through ROTC, University of Virginia. Uh, most of my experience has been airborne light units, 173rd, 1st Ranger Battalion, Company Command out in Hawaii, 3rd Brigade, 25th. Uh, and then my field grade time up in Alaska, the artist formerly known as 425, now 211, uh, yeah. BSB XO. Uh, and a BSB spell up there, sir. Been here about a year now, uh, so I'm currently the BSB XO OCT. Did some time as the SPO OCT. Uh, been here for 10 rotations now, sir. Okay, how many of you guys a player? Ooh, one at JRTC, sir, one over in Germany, awesome. uh, and then two up in Alaska at JPMRC. Okay, awesome, sir. I am uh, Major Wes Lafitte. I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, used my class of 2007. I've been light and heavy artillery uh, my entire career. Um, Previous to this, I, I was at Fort Carson and commanded in 329, a Paladin battery. Um, then I went to uh, Hawaii, did my field grade time there. And I was a Brigade FSO, a Battalion S3, Devardi S3, Devardi XO. I've been here for a year. All that, <laughs> all that KD time. 40, <laughs> 40 months of fun, like yeah. nothing but fun. Um, yeah. It was great. <laughs> Um, you got to do it. I got to do it. It was a yeah. great opportunity. Yeah. Um, I've been here for a year. Uh, my previous role here was the Brigade FSO OCT, and um, now I'm Fox 5, the Battalion uh, XO OCT for the Fire Support Team. Okay. What did you major in at USMA? Life Sciences. Okay. Awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, Major Jim Lee, uh, currently the Brigade S3 OCT, uh, served on time in 101, 4th ID, taught at the career course for three years, uh, and then came here to do my KD time as a Battalion XO in Brigade 3 at 310. Uh, been an OC for just short of a year, uh, 10 rotations as an OC, uh, four as a player, two at NTC, and then two here at JRTC, right. sir. Okay, awesome. And like I said up front, these are some of my favorite people. All right, so. Um, you know, sort of what I'd ask you up front is like, what are the big lessons that you've learned here as a major, uh, either as a player or as an OCT, that you, you'd sort of try to help uh, our, our major friends out there in the Army, um, you know, grow in? Yeah, so I think up front, sir, the one thing that comes to mind is like the amount of control you have to have as a field grade. And really that comes from seeing the field, like understanding the entirety of the problems at the battalion level, understanding the systems that drive those, and then pushing the right buttons to fix those problems and like make sure your own house is in order and you're not creating problems for those below you or those above you. <laughs> Very hard, right? <laughs> I just got chills as you described that and like being back to being a Brigade XO and all the problems I made for battalions and made for the division. I, I think it's teamwork makes the dream work, right? Like right? we're only as good as the people that are around us. Yeah. Um, we all support each other, I think, and have yeah. good relationships. And I think previous to that, like people who are a part of the team and in the fold and want to work together, they do well. And those that don't, they, you know, we still help them out, but they, they have trouble yeah. reaching out, connecting to people and making things happen for the organization. Right. Yeah. Cause it, you know, we got a wire diagram, but that's not really how everything gets done. Right? So it was a shadow government. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, you know, it, sometimes it takes, I don't know if you're old enough, but sometimes it takes the turtle, a hamster and a duck. Right? You just gotta be, right? I got some, you got, it's wonder pets. I mean, you just gotta wonder pets this thing, right? I mean, if we're gonna rescue the baby raccoon, like we all gotta come together and, and do the thing. I think that's, I think that's spot on. 
Sir, there's no secret sauce to MDMP. Everyone wants to know <laughs> how to do it faster and better and it's reps and sets and you know the excuse of there's not we, an We need our own JRTC MDMP hot sauce. <laughs> That's what we need. Like if you just use this every time, it'll be easier. It won't be easier, it'll just taste better. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. I cut you off. No, sir. No, it, it's reps and sets. You always talk about it, sir. There's not enough time because you're probably not proficient enough at it as a staff. Yeah. It, and it gets back to what you know, Jim was saying, I mean, it's, you know, we talk control, you know, we're, we're not talking about micromanaging people's lives. Sure. It's about having the control in the things that we, we can control yes, and routinely control. And the more that we control the things that we can routinely control, then that's frankly bandwidth that we have to solve the things that are really outside of our control. Yes, All right. What do, you, what do you think the biggest myths, right? You get to see all of our friends come from all over the Army uh, here, whether they come here or whether we go to JPMRC, and we get to see them at LTP. I know they're like hitting you up on WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, um, you know, or, or through memes asking you, uh, you know, what's the, what's the secret sauce uh, to this? What are kind of some of the biggest myths that you think uh, field grades maybe bring here? Sir, I think offhand, and this is going to seem somewhat funny given my personality, but it's like you can't have fun at JRTC, right? Like the people come here and they just get beat down for 14 days, and you come out a shell of the, the Battalion S3 or XO you started as. But, like, you know, I remember talking with our Opsar Major as we came out of the box. I'm like, hey, Sergeant Major, I know we need some time to reset, but, like, I'd go back and do that again, like a month from now. And, like, every other month in perpetuity, based on the amount I learned, the fun I had, and like how much better I came out in my craft. Yeah, and, you know, I think the other part of that is, um, you know, especially at the level, like once, you, once you're a major, right, is you just get to see like people just do amazing stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's hard, right? Yeah. You get to see these captains that like, you you know, the, the quiet, you know, captain that everybody's like, well, I guess he's okay, like just crush it, and rock it and do amazing things and, and um, you know, I was thinking about the the battery commander that we had a couple rotations ago, triple seven. She just yeah. she was like large and in charge with fires mm -hmm. uh, in the Kavar arms rehearsals, and it's so cool to see people play big and step up and do amazing stuff. Um, yeah, I think that that part of it too is because you're in a position where you get to kind of see Sorry. see enough. I, I think it's a sense of evaluation. Um, people come in, especially majors, thinking that. They have to know everything, or some people think they do know everything. Right. I gotta stay up 24 seven. I gotta knock this out of the park because my entire career hangs on this. I can't fail, right? Like, everybody's nervous when they come here. Like, no, nobody in their right mind who's coming to a CTC isn't in some way, shape, or form nervous. That is a normal yeah. feeling to have, right? Yeah. Yeah. And people shouldn't be anxious about that. People shouldn't feel bad about being nervous, and people shouldn't have too high of a hubris when they come here. They should be willing to learn and understand you don't know everything. It's okay to fail. You come here to fail so that you get better on the other end. It's about what you do through the failure, not necessarily. Yeah. Not, well, sometimes about how you fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. but, but it's about like what you do after you realize, like, hey, yeah. I got a yeah. shortcoming. How do I overcome yeah. this? Yeah, and I mean, it's not like uh, we're, we're sitting around talking about people behind their back either. And it's not like, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're texting HRC to let folks know, hey, like this guy's draft number just went down, right? Because um, it's not the Joint Readiness Testing Center, right? And um, no, I think that's like hugely important. Like, um, I think there's something wrong with you if you came here and you weren't nervous. Um, I'm nervous. I'm nervous every rotation. <laughs> I'm not the player. But I mean, you um, can get some people who appear, like they're very cool, yeah. calm, and collected, and you're like, man, that guy, he knows exactly what's going on. But I guarantee you inside, he's freaking out. You know, he's yeah. nervous too. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, d I definitely think that that's part of it. And I, you know, I got, uh, I think, five as a player, and I think I'm at 31 as an OCC. And I learned something new here yes, every yes, month. Yes. <laughs> Every, sometimes it's from a former cog telling me, you know, uh, but sometimes it's from a captain and you're just like, huh, I had never thought about looking at it that way. Um, or, you know, it's very, it's something technical, but I mean, it's, this is like absolutely the kind of thing all of us could go back together. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll let Jim be the company commander. You can be FSO, we'll be PLs and we could, we could go through and do this.
all over again at that level, and we'd still learn something. I mean, it's just, um, I mean, that's the nature of our profession. It's just, it's endless the amount of stuff that you have to learn. So I think that that mindset is, I think, huge. Sir, everybody thinks that Geronimo cheats. They just right. do the basics better. So they dig in, they camo up, they move at night, they execute combined arms maneuver. Yes, sir. It's a plug for them. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. They just do yeah. the basics better. And because they get it, and part of it's like they get to do it ten times a year, yes, so they get it, like better at it. Yes, sir. No, I, I think that's that's uh, yeah, that is this kind of mythology that somehow you know they're. Um, and they're not running trick plays. No, sir. Uh, they're they're doing combined arms maneuver. They're doing MDMP. Yes, sir. Uh, they just have a lot of reps at it. Yes, sir. Yeah, for sure. I think that's I think that's spot on. And that is a big myth. I I, I do like to tease Geronimo about it all the time. <laughs> it's good for him. Um, you know, you spent you all have spent a lot of time, and and you know, you've all looked at it from the brigade level down. You've you've worked at, at task battalion task forces, looking at it from the time up. You know, what have you, um, you know, what have you seen the kind of keys to success for battalions solving problems for for either the echelon above them or the echelon below? Them? Yeah, I think offhand, sir, focusing on how battalions solve problems for companies is doing the detailed staff work with the understanding that, you know, at the brigade to battalion level, there's still a chat staff at the battalion level that's going to churn on it. We've got to understand that staff gets cut off to just a company commander, first sergeant, XO and FSO, so really the command group slash staff at the company level. And we've got to do the thinking for the companies in a lot of ways through detailed staff analysis that allows us to control that. So I think that solves a lot of the company problems by like providing predictability, telling them what to do, when to do it, and giving them the time, space, and purpose to execute. Yeah. And, um I mean, you're well suited to have that perspective since you taught the career course <laughs> yes, for three years. Yes, sir. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, and it, I think it gets to one of the other myths, right, a little bit, is that at times we're like, oh, well, the companies will figure it out. Yeah, yeah, I think, sir, like there's a lot of stuff the companies will figure out through adjacent unit coordination based on friction that happens outside of the plan. But we can't use that to absolve ourselves of doing the thinking that allows the battalion to figure out the, the stuff the companies can't. Yeah. Like we've got pretty good staff reference guys that tell us, you know, what the planning factor for class one consumption or for movement rates is, and we've got to build that into the plan and not let the companies figure that out. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting them, you know, that's a good one. Water. We're getting them. We're telling them when we're going to give them water because we've done the analysis to know you're yes, probably going to need water at this time. Yes, sir. Being anticipatory and stuff like that yeah. and not waiting for the bottom-up refinement where, where something's an emergency or we lose tempo based on a company being out of class one or us being out of position yeah, as we, a battalion. We want the company to adjust the, the LRP location by 200 meters, not that yes. we need an LRP <laughs> location. Exactly, sir. Yeah, right on. Uh, for, for me, sir, I think it's higher headquarters enforcing a timeline and a battle rhythm ruthlessly and continuing to execute it no matter what is going on. And when it comes to a subordinate element, uh, solving problems for the higher headquarters is important because higher headquarters can't help you if they don't know what's wrong with you. Accurate right. and timely reporting. Accurate. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, so the battle rhythm part, you know, what, what have you seen that's the key to actually make a battle rhythm work at the battalion level? The XO and the S3, like no matter what is going on, if it's nine o'clock and we see our Cubs going on at nine o'clock, the Cubs happening, right? And you've got a staff to manage the current operations and, and fight that fight, but the key leaders that need to be in that Cub are at the Cub and participating in that, right? You don't get too hyper-focused on one event that's going on. Like the fight is gonna happen, but you have all this other stuff happening that you need to continue on. Like you're, you gotta think of your battle rhythm as like your heartbeat. You skip a heartbeat. That's not good for your body. That's, right? that's bad. <laughs> no, I didn't go to doctor school. Yeah. That's bad, that's bad right? right? And if you do that too much, you die. Right. Right? So, right. <laughs> your battle rhythm's got to be. Let that be a warning. <laughs> you will die. So your battle rhythm's got to be on point. It's got to be continuous. Right? Yeah. What, what, any more kind of thoughts on how we make a battle rhythm actually work, right? Because we say this, right? I got it on a million slides. But practical kind of advice for folks out there, how to make a battalion battle rhythm work. 
and I'm with you. Like we gotta, we gotta do it. That's step one, right? Yeah, I, I think it goes to anything else we talk about with respect to planning and preparation. So you gotta war game it, and you gotta rehearse it uh, before you get to the point you're executing at full speed. Like you can sit down and line out a battle rhythm between a three XO and commander, and if you just take all the people that have to be at the battle rhythm events and overlay that with what's gonna happen, you're gonna see the friction points in that battle rhythm and you can adjust it appropriately. And then you rehearse it in an environment, whether before you get to CTC rotation during RSOI, really great opportunity to like rigorously and ruthlessly enforce it before you get out to the box and you're doing things full speed. Yeah. I think also it sounds simple, sir, but nesting it with your higher headquarters and then your second <laughs> level up there, right? Um, we don't get all be on our own program. Right? <laughs> yes, sir. And then also taking into consideration, you know, your companies if you're a battalion. So if you're running your cub at 2200 at night, now that company commander is getting back at 2300 trying to disseminate information down. So, so taking your subordinate uh, units into consideration as well. Yeah, I think that's important too. And, and also the quality of the event. Like, is this really important? Do I really need to do this or am I doing it just because? because we think an OCT yeah. is watching. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, yeah. right. Like, if you don't need to do it, then don't do it. Don't yeah. waste your time on doing things right. that don't have adequate inputs and appropriate outputs that you need for the organization. Yeah, I mean, I, so, you know, good good battle rhythm events, number one, like there's an agenda, mm -hmm. right? Number two, it has known inputs and known outputs. And then number four, it's got participants, you know, no attendees, right? We don't need somebody taking notes. We ain't got time to just have somebody that's there to take notes, that's right? right? There's enough, and, and you kind of hit everything, all of it's important, but not all of it's like really important, right? And so, you know, inevitably we're gonna make choices where we're gonna say, this stuff is most important, we're gonna do that. It's not that this stuff is unimportant, but we're not, we're only gonna, we're only gonna touch that like once every three days, not every day. Um, we're gonna prioritize it. And, you know, the participants part, you all sort of kind of hit on it to some degree. And I think, you know, you know, is the degree to which we're preparing people that are not the battalion S3, the battalion XO, the battalion OPSAR major to, to participate in these battle rhythm events. Because it, it, it can't, the, you know, the battalion FSO can't be at every battle rhythm event or, or that person will never, ever um, sleep. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, and so are we preparing the assistant FSO or is preparing the FS NCO? Are we preparing the S4 NCO IC to maybe, you know, participate either in MDMP or participate in a battle room event so that we're dividing and conquering? And have, where have you seen that, like, work well? And who's, you know, what are some examples of maybe that working well? Sir, I think the first one that comes to mind, because I got a little bit of scar tissue with it, doing a rotation as a battalion XO with no S4 OIC and no S4 NCOIC, like quickly figuring out who has the best understanding of the sustainment enterprise, which happened to be our uh, FSC XO, and being like, nah, you're not the FSC XO anymore. You're going to be the battalion S4. Yeah. And Hard to do a rotation without a, a battalion S4. It is, sir, right? <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> got to be the person. Exactly, sir. And yeah. that happened to be the right person based on interactions we'd had and based on the established battle rhythm and kind of his understanding of, of what has to go into all of that. Yeah. Um, and then I think secondly, it's using the non-commissioned officer course, or you kind of lined it out with the S4 and COIC, but finding people who can play up one or two positions because they exist, we've just got to give them the opportunity to understand what right. they're doing and succeed. Every day's open tryouts, right? Yeah. Selection's an ongoing process. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bunch of people that want to be selected, and I think that's the way you do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, you've heard this story from me. I mean, my S1 uh, got a concussion. Uh, jumping in here when I was a battalion commander, my S1 into I see uh, sprained his ankle jumping in. Had five, five injuries on the entire jump, and two of them were the S1 and S1 into I see. Specialist was the battalion S1 for the entire rotation. Didn't have a single problem. Um, pr pretty, you know. So I mean, this idea like we got to develop talent. We got people that can do this. We're leaving money. I think on the officer side. We leave a lot of money on the table with our our NCOs yeah. and our junior enlisted. But your your comment, like we got to practice it in RSI. Yes, sir. I mean, if we're if we're saying that the S four and two I C probably should be the person that's participating in the brigade log sync, right? Then they should participate in the brigade log sync in RSI. Yeah. To make it successful. 
Absolutely, sir. Oftentimes, uh, you, you can do this with any number of things, but when we change the environment, we have a tendency to change what we're doing with the standard operating procedure. We, we go from wherever home station is to RSOI and like we've forgotten like what we already have in place. And then we do the same thing when we go from RSOI to the box. So we've got to acculturate and ha uh, habituate people to what we're doing and RSOI is a really good way to do that. I, I think too, sir, so you mentioned that your specialist was the S1 and that's what you called he or she, right? So there's no acting S1, right? You are right. the S1. <laughs> so you get rid of this culture of, oh, I'm just filling into this position. You are the S1, you are the S4, you'll feel those duties and responsibilities. I, I think a lot of times too, people are here in a performance orientation type of mindset, right? We gotta perform, we gotta win, we can't fail. Like, and if I put this person, I give them the opportunity, we might fail. So everything's riding on how that this person be the leader for this one thing. Like, like, no. CTCs are a leadership, leadership development opportunity for people, right? The person in the system and understanding how to operate the system, right? And when we go into LISCO, me, you, we, we might be the first ones gone and like the next man up's got to come up. The next right. one after that, you know, like, so we can't be afraid to allow people to step up. And by God, you know, you're the Devardi commander now. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. No, I mean, that's, that is 100%, you know, large scale combat. I mean, you're, that in West, that is 100% right. That, um, you know, I mean, you watch Band of Brothers, right? Like, everybody in that show <laughs> who survives ends up three or four echelons yes, above where we started in the movie. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think that's true. And in this acting, you know, part of like, you know, like, hey, if if you're if you're dog sitting uh, for my dog, like, you're not going to be acting for long. <laughs> that dog is going to, be, you know, it, you got to be all in on it, and, and you're it. Um, and, and everybody's got to sort of treat you that way, um, because it, you know, otherwise it, it doesn't work. Yes, like sir. You're sort of half step in it. Um, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think it goes back to the the initial comment up front about being team players. And that's what makes the dream work. Like if you've got a field grade that's an XORS3 and we've got someone playing up and they empower that person that's now the specialist S1 OIC to be the OIC and to give direction as the position requires it, I think that permeates itself across the organization in a way that has exponential impacts. And we've got innumerable examples of that across rotations or other situations, sir. And it's just a ton of fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's sir. like, you know, that's one of the high points actually from my rotation. I mean, I had a, I had a uh, company commander uh, that got injured on that jump too. So it was tough, tough jump, <laughs> tough jump. Um, but, you know, the company XO was like, Hey man, you're like the company commander. Yes, first, first aren't very much to his credit. Like was all in and, and 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 acted that way and treated him that way and the staff treated him that way. And it was amazing to watch it. it you know, he didn't like knock it out of the park like on day one. But two or three days into it, like he's just commanding a company. Yes, sir. And, and that's how it works. And it's, it, yeah, it is a ton of fun to watch that. Um, hey, so um, let me flip that kind of question around a little bit. How, how do how do companies tend to create? problems for battalions. Reporting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reporting. Oh, yeah. 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 You yeah. left off with that. <laughs> battalions did. Right? You know, yeah, let's, uh, like, I'll, give, I'll, 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 I'll be, so battalion, brigade, will establish a battle and say, I want these reports on this timeline, and this is what we need to see. And we're, okay, so we'll, let's break this, like, we'll start with, like, routine reporting. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then, and then, later on top of that, like, this, this company's in contact. Yeah. So what? What does that mean? What does that I, mean? I don't get a salute report. I just get, we see enemy, right? No distance, no direction, no nothing. And we'll hear it just get passed on up the chain as incomplete data, right? No yeah. analysis, no like, hey, this is what we think is going on. You just pass information off to your boss. And you, now your boss has to chew on it. And do so it's actually else, right? worse like, than no reporting. That's yeah. horrible. Right. Because then the boss is spinning like, oh, what does that mean? And then right. he's got to continue to ask you questions. Yeah, well, let's, let's stick with the routine reporting and we're gonna come back to the situational reporting. Um, you know, sustainment role. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you know, how, how have you seen that play out? And, and, and why, why do you think we, uh, we have area, room for growth? Yes, sir. Say, why, why, uh, when it comes to, to yes, sir. Uh, so specifically log stat reporting, um, I think, 
I think sometimes we as sustainers make the template too complicated. And I know that sounds like a very basic thing, but you know, the template that's going up to the division level is probably not the same template that needs to go down to the squad level. There should be some refinement on what it looks like at the squad level. And we as field grades and staff officers, I'm sorry, you do the work, you consolidate, you put it in whatever template it is um, and send it up. And then- uh, Yeah, so wait, hold on. I yes, sir. <laughs> no, I like, so, um, you know, there's, uh, a, a great talk that a, a guy named Chris Colbert, who who ran the innovation laboratory at Harvard, uh, gave called "Technology is Dead" in 2018 fintechs in Singapore. It's amazing. So if you're out there, you should check that out. But you know the kind of premise of his talk is like you got to put the user at the center of the experience, right? So when we think about what we're doing. And to your point, it's like, okay, what report do I need from a com from a company? And maybe more importantly, like, what do, what report does the company need to actually be saying? They may not realize it, yes, but what report do they need, and how do I make that as user friendly as possible? So one, I get the company what they need, but two, I make the ability to report as simple as possible. Um, you know, when we when we sort of start to think that way we're probably more likely to get what we want and need. Yes, sir. I, I think too, sir, we always talk about a pace, but a pace by war fighting function, right? So the and, way- And that, I would argue sub function. Yes, sir. Right, because I mean, you can take sustainment war fighting function and we can break in there, whether we're talking maintenance, log stat, casualty evacuation, those are- Absolutely, sir. I mean, we see at log sync meetings, battalion XOs get excited about the fact that they know for a fact their battalion submitted their log sync. Well, maybe they did, but it wasn't on anything that the pace was, and right. then that information's not passed up there, sir. Right. No, I, I think that's um, stress testing uh, our pace plan uh, and validating that it's actually realistic. You know, I, I love it. Like, we're going to do all this on JBCP. Yes, sir. But poor little rifle company out there. Exactly. May or may yes, not be able to do that, right, uh, at, the, at the pointy end of this thing. Yes, uh, what else on routine reporting? Sir, I think, you know, we talked about pace by function and subfunction, but a higher headquarters and a subordinate unit willingness to use that pace and to enforce that pace, right? Like, if we're going to say the E in our pace plan is runner, we better be willing to, one, enforce that a runner will come to the CP to provide the report. Yeah. Or two, like willingly send the runner before we have to like be forced by our higher headquarters right. to send the runner. <laughs> Got some experience with that. <laughs> I do. Uh, you know, I, I've seen many people, myself included, get the opportunity to report to my brigade headquarters right. a, as the runner and potentially be the the liaison right. officer to the brigade. So I may have been said brigade commander and. Uh, <laughs> Major Lee here may have been said uh, battalion XO that got the opportunity to come to the command post. Yes, sir. And the craziest thing happened about after that. We fixed our FM con. <laughs> <laughs> they were crystal clear from there on out. Crystal clear. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Yeah. And, you know, um, you know, back to the, the heartbeat of the battle yeah. rhythm, right? I mean, this reporting, if we do it, if we do some, and, it, and I think you, it gets back to the battle rhythm, too. Those reports have inputs, they have outputs, they have a purpose. You can come up with 30 routine reports. They don't necessarily add up to anything. And so scrutinizing what those reports are, prioritizing them, making them user friendly, yes, um, that, you know, that the outputs from those reports help to drive all the battle room events, help drive the running estimates, which drive um, better decision making, frankly, at the battalion and the brigade level, and then ultimately at the division level, because all this aggregates up to a division trying to solve problems. Um, no, I think that's you know a, a really good perspective of, of prioritization, but also like we got to make this usable. Yes, sir. Um, you know, in Wes, something you kind of talked about, and it sort of goes to some of what you were, you were describing about, well, hey, majors can do some like stuff here. Yes, sir. Right? And it's not even majors. They, they got people. Yes, sir. They can have people <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, is, is I've always thought about it as a value chain, right? So, so what comes from the company to the battalion has, at the battalion level, we got to add value to it, right? Do analysis, aggregating and, and analyzing, and then from battalion to brigade, 
we got more horsepower, we got more capability. We can't just be passing things up and then vice versa. We get an order that comes from division. I can't copy and paste the task down to the rifle company. That's yes, like I guess I could. That's kind of not cool, <laughs> right? And we got to do we got to provide value down in detailed analysis. I think that's kind of how we help our companies out in the long run. All right, the the uncomfortable thing, situational reporting. Why do we struggle with it? We haven't practiced it before we get into the situation where we're reporting it, sir. I mean, you could you could lay it out for a lot of different scenarios, but if we're not um, enforcing the precision of language that forces people to give us a salute report and only a salute report after initial contact, and then under the facts, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Um, like if we're not doing that, we're going to get the type of reports that Major Lafitte described where it's like, well, we have enemy contact. Okay, so what's that mean? And how does it drive a decision for the battalion or the brigade? Yeah, um, yeah and there's a lot of forms of contact. Yeah, right? Nine, as I understand it, <laughs> yeah. sir. Um, that, that, that starts like with something as simple as that. And sir. we're all like guilty of this, right? Like, I can, I'm like processing my experiences as lieutenant and company commander and imagining, uh, you know, Bruce Parker, my battalion commander's frustration with some of my reporting as a company commander. Yeah, absolutely, sir. I'm not saying this because I was awesome at it in the national that I did it. Like, yeah. that's just my experience failing at it that informs yeah. kind of what. Well, and, you know, and the uniqueness here is you really get to see it, like, play out. Yes, sir. You get to see how, as you described, a really bad report will drive a lot of really unhelpful behavior, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or the lack of reporting. You know, this is, you know, somebody knows if only the brigade commander knew right now, like we'd be okay because we got we got a DSM, and you know we thought through just that eventuality, but the brigade commander never knows, and because he doesn't know, he, he can't make the decision that he knows he has to make. Um, yeah, you know, what what are your thoughts? I, I kind of tying on to what Jim Jim said. Like I think people get really affected by stress in the moment. And they get so caught up in what's going on. Oh my God, I'm getting attacked right now. I'm a bit hyper focused on this attack and repelling this attack instead of like me as the platoon leader or me as the company commander stepping back, letting my subordinates do what they need to do, reporting and sending those reports and resourcing my unit. Right? Yeah. I get too focused on what's going on. I want to be the fighter. Right? And which is good. You got. I'm not saying you don't fight back. Right? But right. you definitely got to like observe what's going on, analyze and report up to your higher headquarters. And on the on the on the opposite side of that. Like people got to be measured with tactical patience at the higher headquarters, right? Right. There's a there's a point where you do have to get on the phone and say, hey, like I really need a report from you, right? But if you know they're struggling through something, like don't just be hounding down their throats trying to get incomplete right. information because incomplete incomplete information can be just as bad as having you know no information at all. Right. You know? And then, you know you you brought up um, you know the practice at it, right? And so we got to give ourselves reps doing it. We got to give ourselves reps doing it and our in our situational training and our live fire training home station, um, you know, multi echelon training, squad live fire. I would argue platoon leader actually isn't walking the lane. I got somebody that's really, really good at that. Called it, it's our first class platoon sergeant, right? Platoon leader is receiving reports from squad leader and communicating them back to the company and getting that practice under stress with a real thing that has risk associated with it occurring right and I think that's a way you know it's as you describe that Wes though and I know you know you've all had, had these experiences in combat you know um, I mean my worst day in combat the first thing I had to do was like take a deep breath and like get myself personally in a good place of control so that I was given orders that were clear mm -hmm. um, that projected confidence even though I'm inside I had deep anxiety and then I could report to my higher headquarters clearly and that is really hard thing to do but you know, big takeaways from combat for me uh, is that's like really important because because either you're gonna help calm things down and allow clear decision making or inadvertently you're gonna start to really amp things up in a way that, that create enhances chaos not diminishes chaos any thoughts yeah i think one thing that, that comes to mind as you talk about that sir like 
Uh, as we look at field grade officers at the battalion level, bringing calm to an organization, we do that through the main command post and through the battle staff that's manning that. Like a lot of times we'll see battle lieutenants instead of battle captains or battle sergeants first class instead of battle captains at the battalion level and, and providing the field grade leadership to, to kind of see through some of the friction and bring calm to that so we're not just handling the situation at hand but looking forward enough either through the battle rhythm or through a Hope's W timeline to get things right or to get them as right as they can be yeah. based on what's going on. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's one, I think. Um, I think majors have a tendency to underestimate, like, how impactful they really are, right? And, you know, what you just described, you know, the reality of, of Manning is that we're going to have battle captains that are first lieutenants. Yes, we're going to have, you know, a star first class maybe being the, ba the battle captain um, based off where we're at. And, you know, appreciating where, where those individuals' experiences, um, they're going to feed off the, the, the field grades, they're going to feed off the OPSAR major. And so, you know, clear, calm, um, underwriting um, mistakes because they're there, their leadership's like, hey, hold on a minute, slow down, think through that, come back to me. Okay, that's, that's what we need, good, you know. Not that we're gonna like rip somebody's head off because a first lieutenant doesn't know how to do something, but we're gonna coach them in a calm way, really is, you know, over time, they're, they're gonna grow into it. Um, but I think that the influence that majors have in this is like huge to bring a little bit of calm to what is inherently pretty chaotic um, activity. Anything else on that? <laughs> I mean, no, sir. I think Jim hit it on the head. Like, yeah. keep keep the emotional stability in the headquarters and right. people super feed hard. Their, people feel right. energy. Yeah. Yeah. Super super hard thing to do, but being being mindful of it is, I think, you know, pretty key. And it's funny. I'm. Uh, I can think back. Uh, my my rotation um, as a AS three Valley of Death <laughs> National Training Center. Things not going super awesome. <laughs> Uh, we get a moment of calm, and my battalion exo starts singing "Staying Alive." Uh, we're all like sleeping, bright as hell. But, that, but back to the, the fun. It's like okay, you know, and that. Those are the experiences I think that do help bring uh, calm, but also confidence. Like okay, if the majors like, hey, we got this. Don't freak out. It's gonna be all right. Be all right. I think you forget a lot of times. I know I do. Like I forget what I didn't know as a lieutenant. Right? <laughs> so I, I take it for granted. Like I meet a lieutenant and I'm like, hey man, bam, 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 boom, needs you to go do this, make it happen. Roger certainly goes away and I'm expecting him to come back, yeah. you know, with everything. But I forget, like I've got years of experience and I know well, what this needs to look like. Well, you know, I uh, I had a, a mentor of mine, you know, remind me that, you know, when you're thinking about like what you were like as a lieutenant, what you were like as a captain, when I remember what it was like being a major, you're remembering the last like six months of it when you were like really good at it, right? <laughs> Not when I pivot steered my home my my Bradley into my company commander's Humvee as a lieutenant, right? Or got lost driving out into the box, uh, you know, National Training Center. I mean, that's not what I remember. Yeah, I remember all the things that you know when I was like really humming away, um, and I do. I think that's huge of, of like remembering. Um, maybe the the less awesome version of you in that in that grade or position. Um, all right, hey, what are um, what are just some really good habits uh, that will serve majors well? Um, you know, serving at the battalion and the brigade level. Stay out of the problem itself. You're not the problem solver. You're the problem preventer, and you're the systems manager. So when something arises, you got people that do that for you. Don't get too hyper focused. Focus on the field, like Jim said, and make sure everything is together and run. You see a lot of people because we were great captains, apparently, because we got promoted, right? So, <laughs> so but I mean, you know, yeah. they, they, they obviously were successful as a captain, and as a as a captain, like solving that problem is exactly what you do. That is what you're, you know, absolutely. That's what you get paid to do. Um, but now you get paid not to just. I mean, sometimes you got to solve the problem. Sometimes it comes yeah. to your wheelhouse. Yeah. But you got normally you got people to do that for you. And you organize people to solve those problems for you instead of you being hyper focused on oh I got to solve this one thing. And you got all these other things over here going on, man. And we see it day in and day out every rotation. Um, yeah. You'll see field grades that come in. They're like, yep, um, I know I have this thing going over here. I'm not going to worry about these other ten things because I'm so hyper focused on these things. They forget to elevate, and delegate. Yeah. 
you know, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it happens to commanders too, right? Like, it, uh, at some point, uh, most baton or brigade commanders find themselves being the best battle captain in the formation, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm guilty, guilty as a battalion and brigade commander here, and um, you know, the folks that can put the hand mic down and say, "Okay, I got a battle captain to do that. Let me step back and kind of take it all in." I think that's true of the majors too, it's Jim. Yeah, I, I think to West Point, sir. Oftentimes we say that people have to have a bias towards action, and I think that holds organizationally, but as a major, you've also got to have a significant portion that's a bias towards thought. So when someone comes in and like, hey, we got to solve this now, and it's like, no, we probably need to take like five minutes to think about it, and then we need to initiate the appropriate action to solve it. Because I, you know, back to the bringing calm to the organization, like that'll bring calm to people. If they understand we have five minutes to think about this problem, they'll be like, oh yeah. We do have five minutes to like figure out how to best think about and solve this problem before we start doing something that's going to desynchronize what we're doing with companies or what we're doing with our higher headquarters. Yeah, you know, I mean, an easy one with that is, I mean, even even when we think like the thing that's most traumatic, right? You know, significant injury, casualty evacuation. Like, okay, is the medic there treating them? Okay, cool. Let them do that thing. Have we sent the initial report up? Okay, good. Now let's take a minute. Where this happened? What? You know, maybe bringing the helicopter to that spot is not the right spot. We can ground a vacuum to this point. We can bring the aircraft to a LZ that we know is secure. We know is safe. And, and and even in those moments, like that's a, a yeah. I mean, we got to slow down sometimes. And number one, not make the problem worse. Mm -hmm. And and you're exactly right. Prevent future problems by taking a minute and thinking about what what we're doing and, and delegate, mm -hmm. right. Fighter management, sir. So every Iron Major comes here and they think they can stay awake for 14 days. No one wants to be the first one to go to sleep. And at some point, as a field grade officer, you're more detrimental to your organization than you are helpful. Uh, Say it in, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so we talked about underwriting risk. Can, you know. can I give a story there? Yes, sir. Uh, you know, somewhere out there, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Jackman is, is probably listening. So there, there I am at HKIA, uh, and I probably, I don't know, it'd been, it'd been a minute since I'd gotten some sleep, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Dan Rodriguez and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jackman are, are trying to explain something to me, and I, I, I see the look on their face, and I kind of shoot this look to one another, I'm like, what? And they're like, sir, you're just kind of acting like our drunk uncle right now. And I'm like, <laughs> get my woobie out and I go wrap up and I curl in the corner and I got like the first like three hours of sleep I'd probably gotten in like two days and I wake up and I'm like wait what were we talking about I'm like sure we have no idea <laughs> like we have no idea what in, in, in you know un unintentional but you wouldn't see to you wouldn't drive a car drunk yes, sir. so you probably shouldn't like C2 of a time or brigade truck, right? And, and sleep deprivation, you know, psychologically, emotionally, physiologically is no sure. different, right? If you're not managing rest cycles, you are absolutely impaired uh, behind the metaphorical wheel of the organization that you're helping to, to C2, for sure. Um, who have you seen kind of manage that well, or how have, have units managed that well? Have you seen some good practices? Um, I think there needs to be some humbleness, right, sir? So again, like no major wants to be, to be the first one that is going down for sleep, but so in that top four or five, whatever it is, there needs to be an understanding that probably all five of the battalion leadership don't need to be in the MCP for 12 hours at a time. Someone needs to be working through and being able to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely a balance. Like the three and the XO have to get yep. together and say, Hey, we're going to overlap. I'm going to do 16 yep. hours or 18 hours, whatever it's going to be, and we're going to overlap these four to six hours. And while I'm while I'm here, you go down. It's got to be um, some overlap, and it's got to be discipline, right? Yep. It's not just it's not just the field grades you have to worry about. It's the soldier as well, right? So when a shift changes at zero seven, get out. Like when you're done with shift change brief, get out of the MCP. Don't don't be sticking around smoking and joking. This ain't you know fun fun times. This is a fight. This is a war. Go to sleep. Go get on security. Go do your priorities of work or whatever. Right. I think but, that's the that's that's it right there, and we all got priorities of work and all the times accounted for. Yeah. And so it's like, if you're off shift, you're probably supposed to clean your weapon. Mm -hmm. You're probably supposed to make sure you eat so you don't become a heat casualty. And you gotta get a rest cycle in. Yeah, but the the field grade, sir, and the, um, the ops NCO, they have to enforce that. They have to make sure that people right. are actually doing that. If only we had people. 
Right? And I think this is part is like we got to have that conversation with and we got to practice it with our OPSAR majors that they're like the, you know, the Chew Lee from Bloodsport. <laughs> Give it a look. Like, you feel great. Bad now. Right? And they got to be empowered to do that. And, and, you know, just like the primary jump master on aircraft, like they're not the, usually the senior person who's in charge, that, that we empower the, the OPSAR major to do that. I think in the same way it's empowering the battle captain with like, hey, I'm going to get four hours of sleep because I need it. Here are the three things and only the three things for which you can wake me up. Otherwise, I fully trust that you can execute anything on behalf of the battalion in my absence. Right. And I given them like empowering them to do that, sir, but then also clearly communicating like what the priorities or what the, the FFIR are associated with that. And you gotta do that across the board, you know, similar to what Wes said, sir, about you know, understanding when night shift is off shift, they're either off shift or they're doing the priorities of work you gave them and aligning that back to the battle rhythm and timeline with when we jump the main CP and when we move the staff. Yeah, and we really got to practice this because we're going to do it for, for 14 days in a rotation. I, you know, if we have to fight a large scale war, the war is probably not going to be over in 14 days, <laughs> right? And, you know, the, you know, the invasion of Iraq in, in 2003, I mean, we kind of culminated and we were fortunate, frankly, a giant dust storm, not just that allowed us to get sustainment right, but frankly, let people get a rest cycle uh, and, and, you know, and get back to it. And, um, you know, you, the, the field grades, the commanders, the SAR majors actually may need a little bit more sleep than the riflemen. And that, you know, you know, we're, hey, soldiers eat first, as it should be, but, but understanding that the cognitive functions of what we got to do as, as field grade officers require that we're rested and we've got some water. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think it's hugely important. Okay, hey, before we close out, each of you get a question. Wes, we'll start with you. Oh. You've been, you've been like going over, you've been hitting the, hitting the green monitor. <laughs> right? um, what was Major Harmon's biggest mistake? Oh. That's a great one. Uh, there's a lot. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I came out of CJC. Um, I, I went to uh, Afghanistan as a, you know, came in as a brigade chops. And, you know, bottom line is like, I was not at speed of war, right? I, I, I'd been in graduate school, I taught at the academy, great experiences, those experiences developed me and helped me for a lot of things uh, later, but I was not at speed of war. And I really kind of struggled at first. Um, I mean, the first 90 days, like, not awesome. And, um, you know, it took a while uh, to understand I had to help bring calm and tranquility to the organization. Uh, it, it took a while um, for me to be comfortable like delegating to people and figuring out how to do that uh, and do it well. And, and then it took a while also to like manage my own personal battle rhythm that I was getting the, the rest needed to make good decisions and, and help lead the organization. So you know, for me, that year um, deployed um, what was, it was not awesome, not the best version of myself. Uh, I grew a ton. I was really fortunate. I had a great brigade commander, had a great brigade three, great brigade XO, uh, and I grew a lot out of that experience. But it was really humbling because I, you know, I stumbled a fair bit. And I was fortunate. I had a great teamwork, extreme work. <laughs> um, you know that that I think would be one, and I, and I definitely think I kind of came into it with a little bit of hubris. Um, you know, I was a pretty senior major at that point, um, but like. You got to have the sets of reps uh, if you're going to be uh, good at this stuff, and I think you know that that one stands out. And I think the other one that's tied to it that I learned very late um, was, you know, this idea of like um, empathy um, for, you know, particularly for subordinate units, you know, and, and what was what the perspective of. Uh, battalion commander was uh, when I was a brigade XO and like hey that person's trying to do the absolute best they can for their battalion and so um, you know really trying to seek understanding uh, versus judgment and like once that sort of clicked for me I was I was way I was, I was a lot more 
fun to be around. <laughs> <laughs> Two, uh, I think I I could help prevent problems because like oh, that's like sort of what they're you know is going on down there, and how do I help get in front of that? Uh, and then three, you know, it's just, I was out better able to help battalion commanders get along with one another, get along with the brigade, uh, and we could better serve those units. And it just, it took me some sets and reps to figure some of that stuff out. Those would be the big ones, but it's a great question. Sir, what one piece of advice would you give a sustainer, a field grade officer getting ready to come to JRTC? Oh, um, so, you know, I think it's not enough to just be focused on your warfighting function. And I think it's like, you gotta see the field. Yes, you sir. gotta understand, you know, if you're a SPO, um, you gotta understand, the, in particular, the fires commission, right? Because it's like, okay, what's this really gonna look like? What's, you know, to be able to help anticipate and prevent problems, and then the relationship uh, with you know the the FSO the fires battalion XO in particular and the brigade three to anticipate and solve problems and be able to give the heads up like hey listen here's where we're at right now and you know I see a train wreck coming like what are you guys seeing and, and, and is it me sure. and like this isn't going to be a problem because based on maintenance combat losses or other requirements. I think we got a haul capacity issue coming our way in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I think that that maturity to, to pick up the head and see the field, I think like serves the whole brigade and ultimately the division uh, really, really well. And, that, and that's hard and it takes humility because it's like, okay, hey, I'm pretty good at this, but I don't know as much about your stuff, like help educate me. I, th I think that's the biggest one I'd give. Yes, sir. You know, uh, I may have contradicted myself uh, from the beginning talking about having fun with some of the doom and gloom comments. Right? Yeah. So, you know, from your observations, uh, what are we doing well at the company and battalion level that maybe we weren't doing well three, four, or five years ago? Sir, as a way of reinforcing success. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think w one is I think we're sort of past uh, people trying to ride on. You know their deployment experience, right? And and, and that's just is dissipated over time, and um, and I think that that's it's really refreshing. Like it's refreshing to, to have uh, very inquisitive conversations from company commanders and majors about things because that ultimately is like um, we should we should never lose that. Like no matter how many deployments we've had or what we think our experience is, because the next thing's going to be different from the thing we just did. So that's the first one. I, I do think there's a, a, I think the culture of learning in our army is a lot healthier, uh, and the humility I think that has to come with that. Um, you know, I think uh, tactically, I think we're a lot better with fires than we were five years ago. Um, I think we still, I, I'm really personally impressed with where the fires community kind of is. I mean, I think the fires community has gotten. Uh, you know, for a whole host of reasons, there was a, a lot of atrophy um, of skills because of, of GWAT, and I think they've closed a lot of that ground. I think now we're in a place where the maneuverists and the sustainers, we got to kind of help pick up our game so that all of us together are kind of moving forward. But I think the fires community has made a ton of progress. Um, and then, you know, um, I think I think there's. Uh, you know, the, we, we've seen it a couple times here, like the, the marrying of small UAS and sensors with fires. Um, and, and I think that we're gonna see only more of that and at the company level, like folks being really creative uh, with how we organize and how we employ these capabilities. Um, I think it's gonna be breathtaking. Uh, I mean, I think what we look like in 24 months is going to be very different from what we look like right now because I think we've got the right leaders uh, to do it at the company level. Uh, at the at the major level, um, you know, life of majors have always <laughs> been like hard, right? We, we do hard things. Um, but, you know, I do think there's this, um, I think there's this real willingness um, to work for each other, and I think there's this willingness to work for companies and sort of this, 
you know, the days of like the majors being like company commander, why are you wasting my time, <laughs> are, are long gone. Um, and, and you know, more often than not, what you got is you got you got majors that are, are empathetic to what's happened at the company battery troop level. Um, I think the challenge is, is like the best way that majors can help is, is probably with those processes and systems. That's the way you can help the most majors or the most company battery yeah. troops for the longest amount of time. That's what I would kind of give. But I think that's a good question. There's a lack on right. Yes, sir. Um, dispersion and camouflage, you know, we're not where we want to be. It's, and it's just my year here, it's 100% better than it was a year ago. Uh, and that's not, you know, that's nothing bad about units that come before, but it's clear that people are talking to one another and sharing lessons throughout yeah. the Army to get better. So, all right. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. Uh, the good news is I get to see more of you uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead, so I'm excited. Thanks. Thanks sure, for joining us. Thanks, sir. Thank you for joining us on The Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash linktr dot ee forward slash jrtc. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts. And be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.